Welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist on Facebook Live. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor, co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces this weekly show that discusses common questions about atheism, free thought, and state church separation. And I'm Andrew Seidel, FFRF's Director of Strategic Response. Chances are you saw FFRF in the news last week about our complaint in the Amber Geiger case involving the Dallas police officer who was found guilty of murdering a man in his own apartment, which she said she mistook for her own apartment. We complained to the Texas Ethics Commission about the judge in that high profile case, giving Geiger a Bible, instructing her on how to read it, and basically telling Geiger to come to Jesus. If you've got questions about this, please comment right here on Facebook or send an email to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And before we get into the nitty gritty on this complaint, we do want to celebrate another uh, a victory this week, yeah. FFRF's win at the Supreme Court level. The court declined, I think it was Monday, mm -hmm. to hear a case that FFRF has been winning, so that's always good news. It's a case against creationism, fundamentalist Bible classes in West Virginia public schools. The curriculum is outlandish. And here's a photo coming up on the screen there of one of the textbook pages. This lesson absurdly asked students, students to picture Adam being able to crawl up on the back of a dinosaur. And it went on to say that Adam and Eve could have their own personal water slide. And it asked, wouldn't that be so wild? <laughs> Wildly deceptive. FFRF is suing on behalf of a parent seeking to protect her child from that religious indoctrination in the public schools. Mercer County Schools is represented by First Liberty Institute, which sounds like a bank, <laughs> but it's actually an anti-LGBTQ, pro-Christian nationalist legal outfit from Texas. They argued that because our plaintiff changed schools to avoid that Bible class, that religious indoctrination, that she didn't have standing to challenge the class. Now, this is a pretty ridiculous argument that every other court has rejected. The Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals rejected it as well. And because the Institute feels so entitled and so emboldened with Trump's judges, because it's so hung up on its own Christian nationalism, it tried to appeal this matter to the Supreme Court. And on Monday, the Supreme Court rebuffed their clumsy advances. So uh, I'm laughing because there's a typo that you didn't <laughs> yeah, read <I> that <laughs> said Rump instead of Trump. <laughs> so anyway, that's a very lovely victory uh, for reason and for the Constitution, but the case isn't over. Although I do hasten to point out that after we filed that lawsuit, the school immediately dropped the classes. So no kids right now are being indoctrinated with this absurdity. That's right, and now the case can move ahead on its merits. And with content like dinosaur slides and Adam and Eve, the class shouldn't last long in our courts. And uh, the impeachment, uh, amid this um, impeachment news and the presidential meltdowns, there was the sensational Amber Geiger trial. It c concluded last week in Dallas, Texas. And of course, to recap, I think you know Geiger um, was a police officer who had entered the home of Botham Jean, um, he, his apartment. He came to see who was in his apartment while he was eating a bowl of ice cream, and Geiger shot and killed him. She claimed she thought it was her apartment. The case was fraught with many racial issues and disturbing overtones. But after the uh, conviction and sentencing, um, and when she was found guilty, uh, the judge in the case um, came and hugged Geiger, which is not what we're complaining about, <laughs> and then she gave Geiger a Bible. She said it was her Bible. She instructed Geiger on how to read that Bible, even instructing Geiger that it was her job to read the Bible and otherwise proselytizing this convict. So this personal witnessing uh, was while she was in her judge's robes. Mm -hmm. There were criminal justice officers surrounding Geiger. It, it went on for more than four minutes. So let's take a look at a, an excerpt of a clip of that. This is the one I do every day. This is your job for the next month. You get right here, John 316. And this is where you start. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So Dan and I sent in a formal letter of complaint, thanks to Andrew's quick work, 
uh, to the State Commission on Judicial Conduct, pointing out that this behavior crossed the line from compassion into coercion. That behavior was inappropriate, unethical, and unconstitutional. So the media have responded with a lot of coverage, and the complaint was covered by nearly everyone, from CNN to NPR to the New York Times, Washington Post. Um, it was even in um, conservative media, of course, Daily Wire, National Review, Christian Post, Fox News, Fox and Friends, Lou Dobbs, you name it. Um, and many more fringe sites, too. Yes, and um, Lou Dobbs discussed it with the Trump bootlicker Robert Jeffries uh, on Fox. And let's take a quick look at that clip. And after the verdict was announced this week, that African-American judge stepped down. She hugged Amber. She gave her a Bible and read to her John 3.16 and said to her, this is where your new life begins. And Lou, this case could have caused a racial explosion in our city of Dallas, but because the forgiveness of the family that they exhibited mm -hmm. and the grace of this judge, those flames of hatred were extinguished. This Christian judge is a hero who ought to be celebrated and not condemned by these leftist groups that absolutely hate God and want to do nothing but sow division in this country. Yeah, if, if only spittle were a coherent counter argument. <laughs> uh, notice that Jeffress didn't engage with any of the points in our letter or on any of the legal issues. He just foamed and frothed as if that's a reasonable response. And Trump actually tweeted out this clip. We've got a screenshot here. Nope, we don't have a screenshot. <laughs> oh, yeah. There, it, there is. it is. So you can see, thank you, he says to um, Jeffries. And so uh, whenever we get one of our complaints in the media, um, I think you know Andrew. Yeah. It's not really uncommon for something to get twisted. Reporters like to put the facts into a preconceived narrative rather than reporting on the facts as they are. And that's not always the case, but it was the case here. It does happen. And uh, so today we thought we'd discuss the five big questions or misconceptions <laughs> that keep getting asked about our complaint. And some of these are sincere and some are disingenuous <laughs> um, about our complaint about the judge's actions. And then we'll get to your questions. So I think first, the big misunderstanding, and mm -hmm. we're getting all these calls complaining, um, it was just a hug. What's the big deal? Yeah, that, that one we've heard so much. Uh, and it's so frustrating to hear because we don't really care about the hug, at least not from a constitutional not, no, standpoint. No, it has not, no relevance to what it, we do. Exactly. There's no state church problem with the hug. There's no separation of state and hugging. Uh, but there is a separation of state and church. And the judge can't use her public office to promote her personal religion. That's what we were writing about. And headline after headline and story after story conflated some other people's frustration with the hug with our official ethics complaint about the Bible and the proselytizing. And the two are very different. Yeah, and, and um, I, I took press calls, you took press calls, and reporters would start off with, well, uh, the uh, brother of um, mm -hmm. the man who was killed gave a hug to Amber Geiger. And made religious statements from the stand in his, you know, his personal statements mm -hmm. at the sentencing. Yeah. And, and so what's wrong with the judge doing the same? And I said, well, first of all, the hug isn't relevant. Um, but secondly, he's a private citizen. Exactly. And during the sentencing the statements, you can, you should and can say anything at all you like. You're a private citizen. She has all the authority of the state, all the sentencing power, all the power over the life of this convict. Exactly. And there's a difference between state speech and private speech, which is the continual yeah, so problem she, that we see it, with understanding states or separation in this country. Exactly. She's using the machinery of the state to promote religion, whereas Brant Jean was just using his personal voice to promote his personal religion, which and, is fine. And then we had a conversation, and, and you were speculating, like, how should the judge, who was moved and was truly religious, how, the, how should the judge have handled this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think in that moment, um, the judge, the, we want more compassion in our courtrooms. And there's probably a way we could sit down here and maybe think about a way that a judge could deliver a Bible to a well, prisoner. What you said is when, here. on her own, when yeah. she, she would go after hours as a, as a, a, a private citizen uh, to go visit the she could maybe visit not jail. wearing her robes. And, and, but, the, but even then, there's, even there, like even there, there's yeah. still problems yeah. because 
you know, well, we'll get to this in a minute, but the, the case wasn't over the way people think it was, which is an, another question. Oh, okay. But yeah. So then we also said, this was all about compassion. Yeah. We're complaining about compassion. It was a beautiful moment. Why ruin it with a complaint? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, we, we all agree here, and we say this in our letter that our criminal justice system needs more compassion. Uh, you know, it, it's a, it, it needs a complete overhaul. And it's, it's, it's a broken system, and one thing it could benefit from is, is a lot more compassion. But that, is, that need for compassion is not an excuse to violate the Constitution. And you don't get to turn around and use power that belongs to we the people to promote your personal religion, which is exactly what was happening. And she's also confusing compassion with proselytizing. Exactly. Which, mm. and, and her notion of compassion is, I need to bring this person to Christianity, which is not appropriate. And of course, this person apparently is already a Christian. So, go figure. So, um, then, let's see, I'm waiting for, what was the... Th I think Third the, common yeah, complaint. Yeah, the, the, the trial was over was uh, was another one that we, we hear about a lot. The trial was over. You know, this uh, she was just a person. She wasn't a judge. And we've heard about that one a lot. We alluded to it a moment ago. And, and that one really is not true um, because the judge still has jurisdiction over what is going to happen in the future in that case. So any writs that are going to be made, um, any motion uh, for a new trial, right. reconsideration. Right, I mean, there could easily be an appeal. And even on parole, the judges are often asked to write letters. The families can ask the judge to write a letter, which, given what happened in the courtroom, I would expect to see in this case. And it's not just this trial. It's future trials that are going to occur in the courtroom. If I'm a defense attorney going to practice in front of this judge, I'm going to show every one of my clients that video and say, look, this judge He's is religious. really susceptible to notions of Christian yeah. forgiveness yeah. and reform. Talk, talk about wanting to read the Bible yeah. if you want to get a lower, lower sentence or you want her to be on your side. Yeah, but more importantly, the, it wasn't over. This, this happened in the courtroom. The judge was in her official judicial uniform. There were armed bailiffs standing there with their guns guarding Amber Geiger. And it wasn't just Amber Geiger that was stuck there. It was also everybody else that was in the courtroom with her. Right? It was uh, the bailiffs who were also having to hear all this proselytizing. It was the defense attorneys who were having to hear all this proselytizing. It was the uh, DAs. Everybody, except for the jury who had been dismissed, was still there. And it went out. It was broadcast all across the country. Okay, so then the other questions are like, well, doesn't, doesn't the judge get to practice her own yeah. freedom of speech and freedom of religion? Again, it's that... Mix up between personal and public. Exactly. And it, it kind of really all does come back to that. It's, it's the inability to distinguish when somebody is acting in their official capacity from when somebody is acting in their personal capacity. And when you are a government official, the only reason that judge was in that courtroom beyond the bar was because she was a judge. She was using her official power. So this isn't a question of her exercising her own free speech because she was acting as the state of Texas. So it wasn't her free speech, it was the state of Texas. And I guess I would add that if, uh, well, let's talk about the claim that the judge made that Amber Geiger said mm -hmm. at some point, I don't know if we have it on tape, do we? That she didn't have, she didn't even have her Bible with her or mm -hmm. something like that, supposedly prompting the judge to go into her chamber and get one of, was it three or four Bibles that yeah, she has? That she, said. that she always reads the Bible in the morning, correct? <laughs> Which she can do. Sure. Um, on her own time. On, yeah. It's a little uh, scary, but. Um, so what, how would you answer that? So it, the judge was actually responding to a pathetic request from a person just convicted to 10 years in prison. Sure. Well, as we all know, it is very, very difficult to get a Bible in prison. It's yes, the, that's, <laughs> you can never find book. a yeah. Bible anywhere where mm -hmm, you go, right? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. <laughs> um, but again, it's, it's not, that's not what happened. You know, if the judge had just gone over to Amber Geiger and handed her a Bible and Amber Geiger had asked for it, that might be might not rise to the level of a violation. I still think it would. Well, I think it would. I think it would, but it's it's a closer question. But that's not what happened here. So it's you know, it's kind of beside the point. Well, the judge instructed her how to read the Bible. Yeah. She said start with John 3:16, which is the center of the Christian faith. Then you read the gospel. She told her it was quote her job. Her job to do this. Yes. Uh, I mean, that's a state that, official telling a citizen it's their that's job. That's part to read the Bible. yeah, she needs to do that to stay in good graces with the judge. And we have also seen, um, we've done a lot of ethics complaints over the years about mm -hmm. judges. We have seen um, judges that, for example, have sentenced people to go to church, mm -hmm. uh, sentenced people. I mean, this is basically like in part of your 10-year sentence is also including memorizing and, 
and in taking yep. to heart particular passages from the yep. Bible. Memorizing and writing out Bible verses a certain number of times and in lines, basically. And another question that um, that I got from reporters is, did you get a response yet from the Judicial <laughs> yeah, Ethics yeah. Commission? And, you know, uh, it's, it's different in every state, but um, some uh, ethics commissions don't even want you to publicize the complaint. Yes. We've had heard that once in a while, but um, it was very important to make that point. But they don't respond. They might give an acknowledgement some some at some point down the road. Um, if they ever do a finding, they're not going to tell us. They might announce it to the public. This this requi requires investigation, and they go through their own bureaucratic protocol. It, it, it's a really, really slow process. Yes. And we've been successful on most of our judicial complaints. It's an area that we are very, very successful. Uh, one of my favorite ones was that one, I think it was out of Tennessee, where the judge, uh, two parents wanted to change the name of their child to Messiah. And the judge said, no, absolutely not. There's only one Messiah, and that's Jesus, so you have to name your kid, like, Brad or some, something like that. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Some generic name. Uh, and we made a complaint about that, and that judge actually got bounced from the bench, yes. um, and then was unsuccessful in her reelection. Yeah, there. and I also just want to reminisce about our favorite, my favorite ethics commission complaint was when yeah. former Alabama uh, Judge Guy Hunt. Yeah. Was who was that primitive Baptist capital P <laughs> capital B, which I think is such a funny name for a denomination, <laughs> um, was using the state resources, the state um, airplanes, to go and preach on Sundays, mm -hmm. and we were the first group, the Freedom from Religion Foundation, working with our chapter there to um, complain about that, and eventually he was removed from office. Yeah, that was a big one. He had a lot of other things going on, but that started it. Yeah. So. Um, well, then, do we have any questions? Well, let's, do, we? let's do that last question oh, right I'm there. Oh, I'm sorry. We, so, if you're right, and this is unconstitutional, Andrew, how does this actually violate the law? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a missing piece for a lot of people. Um, so, even if this does violate the First Amendment, what's wrong with the judge violating the First Amendment? I mean, that shouldn't really be a question. But judge are, judges are bound by a code of ethics, and it requires a couple of different things. Basically, two. One, that they obey the law, and if you're not following the First Amendment, you're not obeying the law, so that's a big one right there. And two, that they remain impartial. And it's not just that they remain impartial, but that they have to maintain an appearance of impartiality as well. Anything that is, that could be considered by the public uh, to make the judge appear partial in one way or another compromises the ethics of that judge. And that definitely happened here. As we discussed, she clearly is going to favor Christian notions of forgiveness and Christian notions of reform. And if you're going into that courtroom, you're going to arm your clients with that knowledge. So this is no longer an impartial court of law. You can pander, in other words, mm -hmm. to that judge if you're a defendant or a defense attorney. Exactly. Or a, a prosecuting attorney. Exactly. You know what, how to get on her good side. Yep. Uh, and it, so we'll take some questions in a minute, but before we do that, when I was preparing for this, I saw the judge did an interview on CNN, uh, and I wanted to just show a little clip of that interview. Uh, Bruce, if you can uh, cue that up and we can play it from the, the CNN interview that Judge Kemp gave. Ironically, I was standing in a spot where I had been standing when I was uh, inducted as a judge in this courtroom, and I remembered um, that one of the charges that I was given was to do just to love mercy and to walk humbly. So I was like, mm. she's talking about taking her oath of office, and she's saying she has to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. But that's not from the Texas oath of office for judges. That's from the Bible. That's from Micah six eight. So she's admitting in that interview that her mission was a Christian mission, not upholding the secular oath that she promised to uphold She's when she was She's mixing it up all exactly. completely. Now, I think that we should also say that we took pains in our formal letter to the uh, Ethics Commission to, uh, to praise her comportment during, yes. you know, we had no complaint over her comportment in this very, very heated and difficult trial. Mm -hmm. This isn't a personal vendetta or personal complaint. But she has crossed the line between state and church. Now. Yeah, I think we said by and large she handled it with grace and aplomb, uh, and I agree with that. But there she's admitting on national television the very substance of the complaint that we filed with the commission. That kind she's of digging on herself mission. in deeper. Yep, yep. So we do have a bunch of questions. Um, we have a lot of live viewers. Apparently there are some feisty ones. Uh, we're being warned that uh, we're going to feed the trolls here. So trolls, open up. 
Um, Shanti Claire asks, does this judge have a stack of Bibles behind her desk? Has she done this before? So we don't know. We don't know. She said she has three or four more in her chambers. Um, so she, that does imply that she might be giving them away. Um, it does. <laughs> well, she, I mean, she did admit too that it wasn't the first time she'd hugged a defendant, um, which again, not our wheelhouse. But she said it was the first time that she uh, had had given out a Bible. Okay, uh, so. so as far as we know, I mean, assuming that she's that she's. Um, telling the truth there, which I don't think we have a reason to think otherwise. Um, Michael Romero asks, for all those who keep claiming she wasn't acting as a judge at the time, wasn't it her position that granted her access to the defendant? Would the defendant have been able to cuss her out without contempt of court charges? Absolutely not. The defendant was surrounded by a bunch of men with guns. Mm -hmm. She was in the courtroom. This is the robe judge. She, she was, this is, this, you can't think of anything more formal with a captive audience. Exactly. I mean, it's literally a captive audience, which is something we pointed out. And yes, the only reason she had access to Geiger was because she was a judge in this formal proceedings. Um, oh, FFRF member Justin Scott, who is our wonderful activist from Iowa. From who's Iowa. Probably gearing up to ask some tough questions of, of candidates, candidates Good for which you, we Justin. love. Uh, he says, for those of us out there who either don't follow local law in our area or don't find ourselves in front of judges on the regular, how do you recommend we go about identifying judges that perhaps act like this judge? Well, I don't, I don't think that, um, you know, um, there's a way to do that uh, unless there's been a high profile mm -hmm. case like this. But I think the the question is what do you do, uh, Justin, if you are in a courtroom and something like this happens? And it's a real tricky situation if you're a defendant. But often the complaints that we get are people who during um, voir dire or jury, jury duty mm -hmm. being asked questions are being told to take an oath on the Bible. Yeah. And each uh, most states have affirmations. There are a few states that are, are more um, pro putting your hand on the Bible. Um, but usually uh, judges are so used to doing it that they don't give a chance for you to opt out and then you have to identify yourself. Yeah. And we do have a, a, an FAQ on we, that at we our website. We have a website. great FAQ on that on the website. And we can take complaints on matters like that. But it's usually after the fact that something it like is. that happens. It is your affirmative right as a citizen. You do not have to take an oath on the Bible and you do not have to say the word, so help me God. No court can make you do that. Um, what Annie Laurie is trying to get to is sometimes then you're forced to out yourself as a non-believer. Um, so it's always best to bring it up beforehand. Uh, you know, it's before awfully hard to do that. It, I, and it, it as a juror, prospective juror, I've tried to try to go to the bailiff. Um, but if, if you were actually uh, the defendant, you know, then, then outing yourself becomes more of an sure, issue or, or a, a, um, somebody who is um, speaking on behalf of the defendant. I was um, once in a trial, I mean, I was once before a judge as a reporter um, in a case where an attorney was being disbarred mm. and they asked me to come in and, and um, I had, the, it was a very old judge in Milwaukee and they gave me the religious oath. And when I said I need to affirm, oh, the fuss and bother. <laughs> Has anybody ever asked to do that? You know, it took them a while to find the wording. Mm -hmm. When Dan and I got married, um, when we went for our wedding license here in liberal Madison, Wisconsin, um, we were given, uh, put your, you know, so help you God swear. I don't know if we were given a Bible, but we were supposed to swear to God. And we told the clerk, we're atheists. We can't swear to take a, a swear to God, and so we have to take an affirmation. Uh, mm. Affirmation. We have to affirm. So she promptly found the language to affirm, looking very startled. <laughs> and then she said, and then repeat after me. So help you God. She didn't understand <laughs> what a secular affirmation was. So this is, I'm sure, in liberal Madison, yeah. this is happening. This is all over the country. Well, and, and this is our point about why oaths should be. Secular. One third of the country yes. is not religious. The default position yes, should be a secular always. oath. And then, if a somebody Bible. wants a religious oath, I suppose it could be accommodated. Yeah. Uh, not that that would do anything more to make people truthful. Uh, and the second thing to get to Justin's other part of the question is. I don't think you need to go hunting for judges that do this, but if it, you do run across one of these violations, go to the legal tab on the FFRF website and report a state church violation. You will hear from one of our attorneys promptly. Uh, we'll correspond with you to figure out if there is a violation, the details of that, and then we will work uh, to write a letter as we did here uh, with Judge Kemp, uh, if it's warranted. Okay, so Jenny Korsman asks, so all of those Christians defending it, would it be okay if she was a Muslim and she did the same thing with the Quran? Yay, Jenny. Yeah, very, 
<clears throat> very good I, um, example of why this would be perceived as inappropriate mm -hmm. by most Americans. Exactly. And I was talking with Bruce, uh, our video producer, about this. And, you know, I make that point a lot in interviews, but it, it never, ever makes the news or the cut. Um, but I was able to make the point a couple times on uh, some of the live interviews with Court TV and uh, Crime and Crime and Law TV, which was actually my, f Law and Crime TV, which was my, f my favorite interview of all the ones, um, because it was an attorney interviewing me and he had some good nuanced questioning. Um, but I think that's a very important argument to make. If this were a Muslim judge giving out a Quran, telling someone how to read the Quran and to worship Allah, the same people supporting Judge Kemp would be going oh, they'd crazy. they appalled. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's, uh, we should always, um, and we always do point this out, you know, if you have a year of the Bible passed by a, mm -hmm. a legislature, you have public officials touting the Bible, how would they feel if they were touting the Quran? They, nobody would like it. Exactly. Except a few Muslims. Um, so Jimmy Aaron comments, I bet FFRF doesn't care about any other part of the Constitution but religion. <laughs> uh, he says, y'all just use this to promote your hate. So our, <laughs> I guess the question would be, are we using this to promote hate? <laughs> so I always say that there's really nothing more important I can think of than supporting the First Amendment. And of course, we deeply care about the Constitution and the rule of law, which happens to be a big deal right now in our exactly. country. Um, the Constitution is perfectible. It has gotten better and better as mm -hmm. it has been amended to have a more perfect union. It starts off, we the people, um, the, it invests sovereignty not in a deity, but in we the people, but that's meaningful not just for separation of church and state, it's meaningful for those of us who believe in, in living in a secular republic. And the Bill of Rights are um, so many good things in there. <laughs> we do need an ERA in there. We do. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's lacking that, but of course we care about the Constitution. I mean, and, and that's what the, I think you hit it right on the nose. The this is about the Constitution and about the rule of law. And you know, an injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. To borrow from Martin Luther King, it really is about defending the First Amendment. And if a judge can use a power that belongs to we the people to impose her personal religion on this citizen then that could happen to any of us. And we all ought to be defending the First Amendment. Every American ought to be concerned about that. And that particular um, emailer, if that's, if that's permissible, then that person, you could find yourself in a courtroom and the judge could f tell you why you have to read the Quran. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as, as the earlier caller pointed out. So we're going to keep feeding the trolls here. Uh, Jay Johnson says, the whole prison system proselytizes to inmates, many having no choice but to be present for religious services or getting less time for doing Bible studies and stuff. If you care so much, why don't you stop them too? Well, of course we... We do, Jay. <laughs> yeah. We take, we, we act on complaints. Mm -hmm. We have to have somebody who has knowledge uh, to tell us what's going on. It is, it's an intractable problem. It's, it's a problem all over the country at many different levels. And if we know of something, we will complain about it. We yeah, have and, and uh, we complain somebody about them dedicated all the time. to talking about prisoner complaints. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, we have an attorney dedicated to helping just prisoners. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually wrote a piece about this. I think it was in December for the Friendly Atheist uh, over on Patheos, explaining how prisons are set up to coerce people into Christianity because they get all these benefits. Uh, and this really is a, a big problem. So it's something that we're well aware of and that we've been fighting for quite some time. Also, we won a very important, um, it was a settlement. We took a lawsuit against the federal government because mm -hmm. it was going to create God pods and it had asked in the for prisons. in the in the federal prisons mm -hmm. and it had asked for um, people to submit applications that was going to do, do like for example one God pod would be all Catholic mm -hmm. one would be all Southern Baptist one would be all Methodist that's what they asked for we sued and we stopped it and we have another one from Linda Woodworth uh, Sullia which I thought was Scalia for a moment. Um, my question is, did the judge have previous knowledge of Amber's religious ideation? Did she know she is a Christian and believes in the teachings of the Christian Bible? If that is Amber's belief system, then what the judge did was appropriate. I would have been comfortable as an atheist, but I would have, would have been uncomfortable as an atheist, but I would have been comforted as a Christian. Well, the judge claimed that Amber had said she was, didn't have a Bible. Again, that's, this is not on tape. Uh, part of it, 
part of it's being reported now. They're filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. but, but to, so we don't really have all the information. And it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what Amber Geiger's personal religion is. The, the judge in that courtroom, it is not her role. And it's not and her it. job to, to help Amber Geiger worship. It, at most, I could think what the judge could have done is say, Amber, um, when you get... The uh, prison will get you the, one. The prison will get you one, or you know, somebody will be able to provide you one. Yeah. But she should not have provided it. Yeah. And you know, I mean, we, we talked earlier a little bit about, you know, is there a way that the judge might have been able to do this that would have been appropriate? And we, you and I were brainstorming this. If it was off a, air. As a, in a private yeah, matter, it, but if, again, you're pointing out she still yeah. had jurisdiction. So if Amber Geiger were in prison and the judge went to see her on her own time and didn't use her status as a judge mm -hmm. to get special access or a prolonged visit, Maybe you'd have an argument, but again, even there, the judge is still going to handle writs in the case that come before her, a motion for a new trial that's still going to come before her, um, and probably be slightly involved in the parole. So there's really, she's involved in this case in her official capacity, and it's really, that would be better, but it would still be muddying the waters. There probably would be rules governing yeah. any kind of um, It cuts informal, to the impartiality problem still. Informal meetings mm -hmm. between a judge and a convict, and so I would go with those rules. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a couple more trolls. I'm not sure if, uh, Kirsten, I'm not sure if you're a troll. I apologize. You're not, I guess. Well, what happens if she does this again? Can you sue her? Well, the the remedy here is yeah. what we did. We made a formal complaint to the Ethics Commission, and now it's in their um, camp. Exactly, and it's it's really hard. it's very very hard to sue judges. Uh, and we wouldn't have standing. And it's very yeah, we would need somebody else to come in and do that. But we shouldn't have to sue. Yeah, but I mean, for instance, we're trying to sue Judge Mack uh, in also in Texas. This is a judge who's imposing prayer in his courtroom uh, every morning, uh, and it, the procedural wrangling that is involved in trying to sue a judge it, it's it's a whole process. This is the going the ethics route is the better way to go. If well, possible. but in in Judge Mack's case, we it we, was we appropriate to sue because he was, you know, to explain. He, uh, he was um, bringing in a pastor, and they were going on and on, and then um, he was sometimes conducting them himself. Then he brought in the pastor when we complained, and then he started locking the door. So you had a chance to leave, yeah. and then you'd have to go knock on the door if you wanted to be admitted. I mean, you, no, we had attorneys who represent clients that's right. as law. But that's, the, that's the key point. We have people yeah. in the courtroom who are affected by it. We have people with standing who are yeah. affected by it, and so that, then, then that becomes a suable see. situation. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Brad Cordes asks, uh, if this was against the defendant's will, would she have options for recourse? Um, she would, and I mean, I, this, this theoretically could play into the trial itself. I mean, there could be a motion for a mistrial. I mean, th th there, this could bleed into the overall case as well. Well, for example, if she were an atheist or she was um, Muslim or Hindu or something and didn't like this mm -hmm. and had the nerve to complain about it, yeah, there'd be all kinds of, of repercussions. But again, she wouldn't be likely to. She's a captive audience. Well, and it, she wants to be on the good side of it. Exactly. This it goes to why this is She's so helpless. coercive, right? Yeah. It, it is a completely coercive atmosphere because the judge has all the power there. And again, it's not just Amber Geiger that's being coerced. It's everybody in that courtroom. It's the bailiffs. It's the defense attorneys who have to sacrifice their own interests for their client and have to sit there and listen to this. Who knows what religion they were? I mean, this is not just about Amber Geiger are being proselytized to. This is about a judge misusing and abusing her power. That is what happened. That is what we were challenging. And we had no, absolutely no complaint if she was a Sunday school teacher, if she volunteered and did all kinds of religious things, if she yeah. goes door to door on her own time do it on your for own the time. Jehovah Witnesses. She can do that, but she can't do it with her judge's robes on. Exactly. And in her courtroom. So yeah. that's those are the questions. That's our show for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Tune in next Wednesday at noon uh, for another episode of Ask an Atheist. And don't forget to watch FFRF's TV show, Free Thought Matters. It's broadcasting in 12 major cities, Portland, Seattle, LA, Sacramento, Denver, Phoenix, Minneapolis, Chicago, Washington, DC, New York City on Sunday mornings. It's our unsermon, so you have something to watch on Sunday morning. <laughs> and as well as in Madison, Wisconsin on Sunday night. And you can check out the stations by going to our news link at fforf.org and looking for the Free Thought Matters drop down. And these shows also all go up um, every week on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. And this week's guest is Ibn Warwick, author of Why I Am Not a Muslim. 
And if you're already a member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, thank you. If you're not, we'd love to have you join FFRF, the nation's largest association of freethinkers working to keep state and church separate. See you next week.